The people of Hyrule have always united to take down an evil threat. But what if they didn't? What if they instead turned against each other? Today, I'll be analyzing the collective strength of each Hyrulean nation's armies and seeing who stacks up and who falls short. We'll be assessing the strength of the average soldier in the army, determining what, if any, X factor they bring to the table. And to top it off, we'll run through a hypothetical simulation of what an all out civil war between the nations could look like. And I think there's no better place to start than the most militaristic civilization out there, the Gerudo. Oh, but I should mention one more thing. As I started to put this video together, I have to acknowledge the unpredictableness of war and the almost innumerable variables that can come together to result in one side winning over another. So to try and simplify things for this video, I'll be mainly focusing on the comparison between armies and less about where battles are fought, defensive capabilities of different villages, and so on. I'm not opposed to covering those things in a future video though, so let me know if there's something specific you'd like to see in the comments. Oh, and this is just a fun hypothetical opinion video. Feel free to disagree with me, but let's keep it light, shall we? So if you're like me, your first thought would have been, the Gerudo have this one, hands down. A sizable portion of their population is devoted to their army, and they are seen training more than anyone else, and most of all, abs. But seriously, these ladies will beat you down and throw you out with the trash. By taking a look at their average soldier, you'll see someone with a towering physical build, most likely using a spear as a weapon. Some soldiers are also equipped with scimitars or shields. The Gerudo also have a cannon in their arsenal, which can pack a powerful punch. The Gerudo army also benefits from a clear organizational structure, which can help keep armies focused on the battlefield. At the top, they have Riju, their leader, serving as commander in chief. Next in line is Boliara, who fills the role of general. Then you've got Teak, who is like an NCO, leading her troops on the ground. The Gerudo are also benefited by the fact that they have recent fighting experience working together to deter the Gibdo invasion. Then with all of this, they have their X-Factor, Riju. The young leader can command and call down lightning at will, although she has been known to be a bit inaccurate without the help of Link's arrows. So how can anyone defeat such an illustrious army? Well, hang on, as they're not quite as perfect as you might think. Take a second look at that average soldier, and you'll notice that the armor is not as protective as it could be. A well-aimed arrow could easily break the skin, piercing vital organs. Additionally, as a result of their cultural customs, they have primarily trained and fought in the desert, meaning any warfare outside of it could prove difficult for them. And finally, their reclusive nature would also make it difficult for them to form alliances with other nations. And sometimes, even the most skilled soldiers can be overrun by a larger force. So how many soldiers do the Gerudo have at their disposal? I took account of my own, but we'll come to that as soon as we've finished analyzing the capabilities of all the nations in order to do a more side-by-side -side comparison. Oh, and before I go on, I should mention that I started a Discord server. I'll give more information on its purpose in the description and on the Discord itself, but basically, I wanted to create a place for people of this community to gather and discuss, whether I'm there or not. I'll remind you about it at the end of the video, so make sure you finish this video. That really helps with the old algorithm. Then go check it out. So the Gerudo are an imposing force to be sure, but what about a common soldier who packs an even harder punch? Well, look no further than the impenetrable Gorons. The lack of armor would be a liability to other races, but the Goron skin fills that need on its own. The Gorons are also known for their incredible strength, smashing entire boulders and mountainsides into pieces. Pretty sure there aren't very many people who say they can do that. They can also curl into balls and roll across the ground, thus not only becoming an even harder nut to crack, but capable of moving at fast speeds. A rolling Goron could easily knock a Hylian or other similarly sized creature out of the way. The Goron X Factor comes from Unobo, who has demonstrated both defensive and offensive capabilities. He provides an explosive force that can blow any defensive barricades out of the way. But despite their many advantages, the Gorons aren't perfect either. Let's take a moment to focus on their weapons. The Gorons could potentially be capable of mass producing weapons, but assessing their current output shows that they spend most of their effort making large hammers and pickaxes capable of breaking rocks. To be fair, I wouldn't want to get hit in the head with those either, but it represents a larger concern. The Goron are really not known for their militaristic might. Sure, they can pack a punch, but how organized are they when they are called on to do that, literally? It doesn't appear to be a formal army or even a volunteer one. Don't get me wrong, I don't think I'm surviving a blow from someone's boulder breaker, but the lack of discipline or former training could be the factor that keeps the Gorons from winning outright. 
Also, I suppose I should mention they're currently working through some kind of drug epidemic, but yeah, we'll ignore that for this assessment. But first, let's focus on another group that specializes in spears and wears next to nothing, the Zora. The average Zora soldier wields a spear and is highly adept moving in the water. There is also some evidence of Zoras being trained soldiers as guards are seen posted throughout the domain. In addition to their spears, they also have swords, claymores, and bows, which can help their soldiers face a variety of opponents. And their skilled weapons maker can provide them with what they'll need. They are also fortunate to have a battle experienced leader, King Dorofin, whose battle against a guardian has been memorialized in the domain. Prince Sidon has also shown to be brave in the face of danger, helping Link to board the Divine Beast in the Breath of the Wild era. Sidon, as well as some other Zora, can also provide healing and defensive abilities to those who are injured or under attack. Not to mention, Sidon's smile can stop anyone in their tracks. But surely something can stop these slippery water warriors, right? Well, one major black eye they'll have to deal with is their weakness to electricity. It wasn't long ago that an electric-wielding Lionel had the entire community worried. Not to mention, it would be difficult for them to thrive in hot or dry environments like Death Mountain or the Gerudo Desert. And of course, we can't look past the lack of armor, which leaves them susceptible to anything pointy. Ouch! We know they're capable of making armor that fits a Hylian though, so who knows, maybe they could armor up for wartime. Speaking of Hylians though, I say it's high time we take a closer look at Hyrule's ruling nation. The average Hylian, not to be confused with your average Hylian, can be seen wielding all sorts of weapons. Everything from proper swords to whatever they can find lying around. They often carry shields and utilize horses to carry supplies and get from place to place. The Hylians also have their own soldier's armor, which boasts some of the strongest defense in the land. They also control multiple settlements, which provides them with a huge supply of resources to support their army. They also benefit from not having any major weaknesses, like the electricity of the Zora. Oh, and I should probably mention their ultimate weapon. There's this guy named Link, and he's just a tad overpowered. So yeah, that pretty much concludes the video. Link wins. Thanks, everybody. Okay, okay, I agree. That's not a very satisfying outcome, so we're just gonna downplay his abilities for this one. Same goes for our light-wielding princess. We'll mainly focus on the army. Which, speaking of, what is the current state of Hyrule's army? In past eras, Hyrule has been known to have quite the formidable army, but how is it today? Well, if the monster control crew is any indication, Hyrule's army is less of an army and more of a citizen militia. Some members of the squad have less formal training than others, that's for sure. Looking at you, Buckethead. In addition to this, while the Hylians don't have any major weaknesses, they also don't really have any major strengths. Gorons have their power, Zora have their water ability, and Hylians have... Uh, style? But in all seriousness, maybe their greatest strength is diplomacy? Because they are known to always have strong ties with our next group, the Sheikah. The Sheikah are something of a wild card to me. The average Sheikah warrior is stealthy and quick with a blade, but also seem to be a bit on the elderly side. But in fairness, that doesn't seem to hold them back. The Sheikah are also proud to have people like Pura and Robbie, who are absolute wizards with technology. With the power of tech on their side, there's almost no limit to what they could do. No doubt they could quickly reverse engineer Zonai devices or even rig up some guardians to throw at their enemies. In war, they could also harness the power of the Pura Pad, which could allow them to teleport freely across Hyrule, taking their enemies by surprise. But the Sheikah aren't invincible, and their numbers appear to be few. We'll get back to those numbers in a moment, but if something took out their tech whizzes, they could be in some real trouble. But who could sneak up on people who are so sneaky themselves? Why, none other than their evil twins, the Yiga! The Yiga are known for their sneak tactics, surprising those loyal to Princess Zelda and swearing allegiance to the Demon King himself. They are led by the charismatic Master Koga, who is a master of the arts. They can also disguise themselves as just about anything they want, even including trees, and are talented archers and swordsmen. And if that's not enough, they've mastered the art of building Zonai vehicles, which gives them a deadly advantage over the less technologically inclined. Despite all their skills though, they've never found a major foothold in Hyrule. They also have an unhealthy obsession with bananas, which can immediately turn the most battle-hardened warrior into a giddy little child. But who knows, maybe in the right situation, they can get the edge they need to conquer Hyrule. And before we tally up the troops from every civilization and give a final verdict, we have to fly over to the Rito. Eh. The Rito brings some obvious advantages to the battlefield, the most obvious, of course, being their ability to fly. 
Being able to quickly soar from point to point while firing arrows down on their enemies is hard to match. The Rito also have multiple weapons beyond that, such as swords and spears. They also have some renowned warriors among their ranks, as well as a dedicated training ground that is used to hone their skills. Not to mention, Teba can also create an exemplary bow for use in combat. Despite their advantages though, the Rito also have their downsides. They too are victim to a lack of armor, and if they lose their ability to fly, such as through injury, they'll have trouble outrunning an incoming enemy. Obtaining supplies has also been an issue for them. Even after the Great Blizzard had subsided, they still had to be laser focused on ensuring they had enough supplies to sustain their population. But that's enough analysis. Even the most skilled warriors could fall under the weight of a less experienced, but larger army. So how big of an army does each nation actually have? Your average Hylians army is currently at around 25,000, but we're always looking for more recruits. So if you're liking this video, or any video I've made, and still haven't subscribed, come on man, click that thing. It's not gonna bite you. We're just trying to have a good time here and want you to be a part of it. Anyway, well, I could have walked into every corner of Hyrule, taking a census of how many people belong to every nation, I just don't have the time. I'll leave that one to any Austin. What I do have though, is this unofficial census that has tracked everything to exist in Hyrule. By inserting the code NPC, whatever that stands for, I could get an idea of how many people belong to each nation using their descriptors. Then by using this other piece of unofficial Breath of the Wild era census data supplied by Tesla Darby on Reddit, I can get a close idea of how many members of each population are either children or seniors. We wanna focus on the number of military age citizens, which would be classified as adults. I would note though that most of the Sheikah seniors are still military age by their standards, so I included them in their army count. So without further ado, here's roughly how many adults are in every nation, going from the smallest to the largest. Let me know if these numbers are what you thought or if you were surprised. Our smallest nation is the Sheikah at 11. Next is the Rito with 21, followed by the Zora at 27. The Goron aren't much larger at 34. Then we see a little bit of a jump with the Yiga coming in with 72. Then there's another jump for the Gerudo at 82. Then of course, the Hylians boast the largest manpower coming in at 257 military age citizens strong. So the question then becomes, is manpower alone the determining factor in deciding who wins the war for Hyrule domination? Do we just hand it over to the Hylians and call it a day? I don't think so. Even though the Hylians are dominant in numbers, I think we have to consider some of the factors at play here. So like I said, there are so many ways a civil war could go, but let me present one possible take on it. As news of a civil war reaches each corner of a once united Hyrule, the Sheikah are quick to make the first move, but theirs is a defensive one. The Sheikah make contact with the Hylians and the two form a quick alliance, as they have done during conflicts over the past thousands of years. The Sheikah agree to share their technology and weapons in return for the protection, supplies, and building expertise of the Hylians. Over to the west, the Gerudo and Rito meet in combat. The Gerudo boasts about four times as many soldiers as the Rito, but the Rito are able to make quick work of the Gerudo frontline soldiers, hitting the gaps in their armor with arrows from above. The Gerudo numbers are ultimately too much though, and manage to snipe the Rito out of the sky with their Gerudo bows. The Rito, who aren't killed instantly land, but aren't able to outrun the charging Gerudo, who ultimately defeat the last of them. In the northeast, the Hylian and Sheikah alliance is facing a test of its own. The Zora have launched a lightning offensive on the isolated Hylian Terrytown territory, hoping to quickly cut them off from the main Hylian army. The small village militia, made up of the town's bravest citizens, are no match for the trained spears of the speedy Zora, who maximize their aquatic advantage to decimate the waterlocked town. A little to the west, the Gorons have also zeroed in on the Hylian Sheikah alliance, but aren't facing a pocket of isolated Hylians, they're facing the core army, which is backed by the Sheikah. The unorganized Gorons roll themselves forward, bowling Hylian defenders out of the way and swatting them aside in droves with their swinging combo crushers. Yonobu in particular is making great progress as he blows up squads of Hylians like an anthropomorphic bomb. The Gorons cheer as they see the Hylians begin to retreat, but the cheering quickly ends as they realize the Sheikah have lined up their latest weapon. By repurposing their Skyview Tower technology to launch explosives, wave after wave of bombs begin to rain down on the Legion of Gorons, smashing them to bits like any bomb flower would do to a cracked wall. As the dust clears, only an energy shielded Yonobo remains. He quickly retreats back to the heat of Death Mountain, defeated and alone. Back to the west, the Gerudo are preparing to begin an assault of their own on the Hylians when they catch sight of a flying machine streaking through the blue sky. 
Is this some kind of new Shika weapon? In a moment, they have their answer. They hear a short <laughs> chuckle, and suddenly a handful of their soldiers drop as Yiga warriors have teleported in behind their lines and struck them down. The flying machines are Zonai devices commandeered by the Yiga. While the Yiga have caught the Gerudo by surprise, the Yiga are a known enemy. The Gerudo soldiers were prepared for this moment, and they begin to quickly empty bananas out of their inventories. The Yiga assault grinds to a halt as they are distracted by their favorite treat, and the Gerudo use the window to make quick work of the foe, eliminating them. Soon, only Master Koga remains, but he quickly crushes himself under a spiky conjuring of his own making. Over in the Hylian territory, the Zora have emerged from the rivers as they engage the Hylians on solid ground. The fight isn't as one-sided as the Battle of Terrytown now that the Zora are forced to fight outside of the water. However, the Zora Spears are gaining the upper hand, especially with injured Zoras getting healed by Sidon and others, allowing them to rejoin the fight. Should the fight continue as is, the Zora will surely be able to grind out the victory. But suddenly, there is a flash of lightning and crash of thunder as Riju and the Gerudo arrive to join the fight. Hylians are knocked aside, but the Zoras begin to suffer devastating losses. Riju's lack of accuracy doesn't matter here, as hitting the water filled with Zora makes for a massive blast radius. The Zora are no match against an electric opponent. They try to retreat, but Riju's lightning is too much, and they are forced to surrender. The final battle is set. The Hylians have suffered major casualties, but the Gerudo will still have to overcome the technological might of the Sheikah. Riju begins the assault by conjuring her lightning, but it gets cancelled out by the light abilities of Zelda, and Riju isn't able to accurately hit the landlocked Hylians without the help of Link's arrows. It looks like this one will come down to the two armies going head to head. Despite their numbers advantage, the Hylians begin to fall quickly to the experienced Gerudo soldiers. Their only hope is that they can keep them at bay long enough for the Sheikah to use their weapons and stop the desert threat. The Sheikah tech specialists begin to fire their cannons, but the Gerudo aren't like the inexperienced Gorons running mindlessly into a fight. Boliara and Teek bark orders to their troops, and they change tactics, breaking into smaller groups that can avoid taking collateral damage. With the Sheikah weapons effectively neutralized, the Gerudo break through the Hylian lines and put the Sheikah geniuses under their spear points. The Sheikah quickly activate the Pura Pad, teleporting them away to safety, but admit defeat by doing so. The remaining Hylians surrender as the Gerudo claim Hyrule as their own. So, what's your take on it? You agree or disagree? Like I said, there's a lot of room for a different outcome. I didn't even mention the fact that over a thousand Koroks could show up and start carpet bombing the place. And most people can't even see them. But in any case, give me your take in the comments, or jump over to the Discord where you can join the community conversation in a battle of the minds. In any case, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Talk to you then.